Genesis chapter 20, we'll look at the 18 verses that uh, are contained in this chapter. We're going to jump then at the end, chapter 21, and continue the story of Abraham and Abimelech in chapter 21, verse 22 to 34. The title of the message is The Integrity of the Unrighteous, and contrasted to the lack of integrity of the righteous, in this case, uh, Abraham. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we uh, want to come to you now and ask that, um, Lord, you give us an open heart, open ears to hear, that we might learn something about you that maybe we, we knew, but we needed to relearn it or understand it in a greater way. And this idea of your grace and your blessing, your love for us, and that is not based on performance. It's just something even, and we can hear it, but I pray that we'd see it. In the life of Abraham through this chapter, and Lord, it might change our relationship with you. It might change how we think about you and relate to you. Lord, and our love would grow for you as, as a result. So that's, our, that's my prayer that you would do in our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's not a good day for Abraham. <laughs> He's been doing pretty good. Kind of had a little diversion there with the Lot and for a couple of weeks in our study, but we're back to Abraham. And when we left off, he was doing pretty good there. He's been walking with the Lord, doing well, and, and he has God show up with a couple of angels and say, this time next year, Ab uh, your, uh, your wife Sarah is going to finally have, at the age of 90, uh, this promised child, and uh, you're getting up there yourself, and, uh, but uh, the promise is finally going to come true. He's kind of banking on that, writing on that, and then he makes a move, he makes a change, and he moves south into what we would call Philistine territory or the southern part of the Gaza Strip today. Uh, and he ends up, well, he gets a reputation in that neighborhood as Abraham the liar. And, uh, and it's like, wow, wow, <laughs> again, again, Abraham, <laughs> you're gonna have to repeat the same old sin, the same old lie once again. Now, none of us ever do that. We never get caught up into the same pattern of sin over and over again. But you probably know somebody somewhere that does, so this could be helpful to them. That's why I'm pointing this out to you. But uh, I just, uh, here he goes again. We've mentioned, uh, again, the idea that the Bible tells the truth about all people, including God's people. It tells us that Noah got drunk, that Moses lost his temper, that David committed adultery, and then plotted the death of one of the military heroes of the nation. Peter denied the Lord three times, and even Barnabas laughs into false doctrine. The Bible doesn't tell us that to discourage us. It tells us that to warn us. And uh, we're going to see that in Abraham's life this morning as well. Okay, chapter 20, the first two verses. Here he is. Abraham commits the same old sin. And Abraham journeyed from there to the south, and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So commits the same old sin, we would say, as he did in Egypt. It's uh, decades later. He journeys down to this area that, as I mentioned, would be in, in Philistine territory. And he tells the lie to Abimelech. Abimelech is not the guy's name. It's his title like Pharaoh, like Tsar, like King. We're going to meet another Abimelech later with his son, uh, Isaac. It's not that that guy is like really old. It's probably his son or his grandson or whatever, but it's just a title. Uh, the issue here, once again, if you weren't here for the study the first time that we see this come out in the life of uh, Abraham is 
he's, uh, he's going through immigration. Remember back in Egypt, he's uh, married to Sarah. She's about 65 years old. And at 65, as apparently so beautiful, he knows or realizes or suspects, as was the custom, that she might be observed by one of Pharaoh's men there in immigration and then taken to be part of his harem. Of course, they wouldn't do that if she has a husband. So if you were to kill the husband, if you'd have a little accident, then that would clear the way for her to be part of his harem. Uh, he realizes that. Apparently, that's typical. We're going to find out from this text as we continue on in the narrative that they cook this story up when they leave Ur of the Chaldeans. So uh, evidently, that was a, a concern right from the, uh, the very beginning of their, of their journey. And, uh, and of course, you know the story. That does happen, but they have this idea. He says, she's only my sister and not my wife. So Pharaoh takes her. Uh, and we tried to take Abraham off the hook a little bit by saying that he may have been thinking that as the brother that a uh, dowry would have to be arranged uh, for her to become one of his wives. That might take him a few days or a few weeks, and that might give him a chance to get out of town. We're kind of trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Otherwise, it's pretty stupid, isn't it? But uh, nonetheless, here he is. You know, he does that, but he learns his lesson. God protects them. God begins to judge the house of, uh, of Pharaoh and so forth. And then it becomes revealed to him that he's taken another man's wife. And uh, he basically gives Sarah back. He uh, ends up uh, letting uh, Abraham leave. And he gives them all of this wealth and so forth that they send off, off with him. Now, I just want to say that that was a really bad idea. God should have really beat him up a little bit, probably given him some terrible disease and so forth, you know, to really teach him a lesson. Don't you think that's what God should? Yeah, but uh, that's the way we think, isn't it? Uh, and, uh, and because we think that way, we think God thinks that way. But see, God is holy. He's completely different. You know, even in our own relationships, we have a tendency to think other people think like we do. So we make statements like, I can't believe he said that. I can't believe they did that. Because we wouldn't. But we don't think the same way. We're not, we don't have the same. Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And then notice that, and she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart, in the innocent of my hands, I have done this. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know you did this in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So we get introduced here to, in a little more detail, to Abimelech and find out that he's a man of character, but God calls him a dead man. <clears throat> See, again, if I'm writing the Bible, I just do this way differently. You know, I mean, I got the bad guys or the liars, the good guys or the guys that have integrity and tell the truth, but it's like they just swapped hats here. You know, I just don't, I don't get this. But uh, notice how God deals with them. He's protecting Abraham. He's protecting Sarah. He's watching over them even when they're really messing up. Can you think of God doing that in your own life? Even, even when you're blowing it, God's watching out for you and watching over you. Because he knows. He knows his plans for you. He knows how he's going to use you. He knows how he's going to allow certain things to develop your character. So you finally kind of get the, I think I can just be okay in the nobody category, Lord, and just really trust you. The Apostle Paul said that your grace is sufficient for me. For, for uh your power is made perfect in weakness. He says, therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. Paul understands this idea of being completely dependent upon the Lord. Psalm 105, verses 12 to 15, prior making reference of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Kind of an interesting little commentary, insight on this whole idea. They, Abraham, Isaac, and, uh, Isaac, and Jacob, when they were few in number, verse 12, indeed very few, and strangers in it, when they went from one nation to another, that's what Abraham's doing now. He just went down to the Philistines. 
from one kingdom to another. He permitted no one to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sakes. That's what's happening here. Saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. Pretty interesting, isn't it? God is watching this whole thing and protecting them through the whole process. And as we continue in the story, man, there were times when Isaac, hey, well, they didn't do so great either. But God is still watching out over them. Secondly, about this character of Abimelech, it's, again, he makes reference to his own integrity, and so does God. But despite that, God spoke to him about this situation, and he obeys. He's not a believer, and yet he's still a dead man. And that's where we were at, too. Without being a believer, the only difference between these two guys is one of them has placed their faith in God, and the other one has it. And that's, that's the only difference. The one that placed his faith in God is blowing it. He's lying. He's not trusting God, but he's still God's child. God's still watching over him. God still loves him. God still has a, a future ministry for him. God still has a plan for him. God's going to bring him back around. Abraham the liar. And then there's Abimelech, the pagan man with tremendous uh, integrity. And God says, uh, uh, you're a dead man. And the only difference between these two, again, is uh, is faith uh, and our trust in, in the Lord. Very, very interesting. Ephesians uh, 2, 1, Paul says this about you and I, and you were made alive, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. We were all, Paul says, dead in our trespasses and sins. We were all like Abimelech. <laughs> you know, and, and, and maybe you were a guy of real integrity, uh, a woman uh, that uh, was completely honest and moral. I have to tell you, I've, I've met some unbelievers. I wish they were believers. I, in the business world and different dealings, I've met unbelievers that sometimes acted in much more integrity than the, than the unbeliever. Okay, the business guys are going, uh, I don't know if we know the same guys, but I've had the same situation happen to me. It's unbelievable, I mean, yeah, in a way. Uh, sure, it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't happen that way. But our eternal life and our relationship with Jesus Christ is based on Jesus Christ. Isn't that a good thing? <laughs> Even when we are faithless, he is faithful because he can't deny himself. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. I think we're going to have to change this. The, the walk of faith or the journey of faith of Abraham to the journey of grace of Abraham if we, if we stay with him much longer. We're kind of hoping he'll get it together here. What do you, what do you think? I think God's going to work with him. Uh, very interesting. In verse 6, And God said to him in a dream to Abimelech, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. God says, Yes, you're a man of integrity, but I'm the person that's really in control here. And I kept you from doing what you might have done otherwise. And, uh, and God is watching over. I withheld you from sinning against me. First mention of the word prophet in the Bible. Abraham's a prophet. Return his wife, he'll pray for you, and you'll be healed. Well, a little confrontation now between Abimelech and Abraham because of the deception. Verse 8, So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called on all of his servants, and told them these things in their hearing. And the men were very much afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I offended you, that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. Then Abimelech said to Abraham, what did you have in view that you have done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, surely the fear of the Lord is not in this place. They will kill me on account of my wife. But indeed, she is truly my sister. Still trying to weasel out here a little bit. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me. See, it's kind of the God's fault, really, when you analyze it, Abraham says here. God caused me to wander from my father's house. And I said to her, this, this is your kindness. <laughs> Honey, would you just do me a little favor? This is your kindness that you should do for me. 
in every place, wherever we go, say of me, he is my brother. Sure, honey, no problem. So uh, they start off together from Ur of the Chaldeans with this whole idea in mind. Abimelech confronts Abraham, what have you done to us? How have I offended you that you've brought this great sin on my kingdom? We note of Abimelech, the references to us, to me and my kingdom, demonstrate he is very much concerned because Abraham and Abraham's sin and Abraham's lie has now put not only he but his household and his whole kingdom in danger for their very lives. I think he believed God when God said, if you don't get this right, I'm going to kill all of you. Okay, we're going to do our best. I'm going to get up really in the morning, tell everybody. They're kind of shaking in their boots. And then he goes off to confront uh, Abraham. Who are you, anyway, that you would do this? Again, this is the pagan king, the Philistine king, confronting the uh, believer, Abraham. But notice what he says in response. I thought there was uh, no fear of God in this place. That's really the problem. Abraham's the one that didn't fear God, right? Because the fear of God is a deterrent to sin. If he really feared God, does he keep up the lie? Does he go back to the old lie? Does he come back to it again? Uh, I don't think so. If we have a fear of God, it will be in a deterrent to sin. We used to have a, a, a saying in our, in our society, in our culture. We would say of some people, he is a God-fearing man. What does that mean? It means he fears God. He walks with God. It said something about the character uh, of his life. And, of course, Proverbs is full of this concept of fearing God and how important it is. And so it begins uh, the book by saying the fear of God is the beginning of, well, it says wisdom. It means everything. If you're going to understand anything about wisdom and walking with God, the foundation has got to be that I fear God. What does it mean to fear God? Does it mean have a reverence for him? Yes. But it also means to be really afraid, really afraid. You don't really want him to get, to get ticked off. We have a friend that's a third degree black belt, and we're really glad that uh, they're our friend, and we're really glad that they never really get mad at us, or I would be afraid. You know, we're to, we're to fear God and appreciate the fact that he loves us, and he has shown us his grace. Proverbs 2, 1 says, my son, if you accept my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Do you want to have wisdom? Do you want to be able to make good decisions in your life for you and your family and your career and walking with the Lord? The foundational thing you have to understand apparently is the fear of the Lord. Then you find uh, the knowledge of God. Abraham was the righteous man of faith. But in Gerar, sin overcame him, and he erased his witness. He commits the same old sin. Abimelech is the guy with character. There's a confrontation, but uh, very interesting, the charity that is shown to Abraham now, verses 14 to 16. Then Abimelech took sheep, oxen, male and female servants, gave them to Abraham, and he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, See, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. Then to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everyone. Thus she was rebuked uh, as well. So Abimelech's charity certainly seen in these gifts. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, again, this mind-blowing concept that <laughs> he's down there blowing it, lying, same old sin, endangers this guy's. Uh, you know, uh, home and uh, his family from being judged by God, uh, blows his witness, uh, might lose Sarah, might lose what would be Isaac born to him a year later. Again, if I'm God, I'm just going to kind of, you know, whack that boy around a little bit, kind of teach him a lesson here. But what does God do? God blesses him. We don't really see that coming, do we? I don't. I mean, I, I'm thinking that, you know, if I'm really doing well in my devotional life with the Lord, if I'm, if I'm you know, trying to be kind of on my toes and the uh, Colossians 4, 5, you know, to uh, uh, be wise in the, way, in, the, uh, in the way you act towards outsiders, 
not always so wise, but be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you know how to answer everyone. If you're kind of on it and you're looking for those opportunities and things are going you're kind of anticipating a little blessing here from God, aren't you? What if you're not doing so well? What if you're lying? What if you're blowing it? What if your whole witness is kind of destroyed? Are you kind of getting up the next day and think the Lord's going to bless me today? I just see it coming right now. See, we, but is that what happened? That's what happened, isn't it? We, we connect this thing with our performance as opposed to God and his love and his grace and his mercy and all those attributes that we like to read about and sing about, but we still think God think, thinks like we think. And we wouldn't do this, would we? Would you do this with your kids? You catch them lying. Well, I'm going to buy you a brand new car tomorrow, son. It was just awesome. You're not going to do that again. Right? See, we just don't, we don't really go that way. This chapter just kind of blows my thinking about God. It makes me want to alter my theology and actually think that, you know, God really doesn't want to bless my life. And it's really not performance-based. Should this alter my, my life somewhat? Should cause me to really love God? It, that's, that's what, you know, it, doesn't that what God, in the New Testament says, it is his goodness that leads to repentance. And we think it's a big stick <laughs> that leads to repentance. You know, and God will do whatever to get our attention, but uh, I hope this kind of alters our thinking about God. Incredible gifts given to Abraham. And notice also, he gets a green card, right? He says, uh, uh, no longer alien status. You can go in the land wherever you want. In fact, your kids can have uh, in-state tuition. They don't have to pay out-of-state tuition while they're here. I mean, he just kind of lays out the whole, whole immigration policy has changed right here. Right here, because of God's grace. And then he deals with Sarah. Uh, he gives a thousand pieces of silver as a token for Sarah. A, a typical dowry in that day might have been 50. So basically, um, man, he gives, a, he gives way over the top of what would even be any kind of a normal gift uh, at all. To say to her and to everybody else, nothing happened here. She's his wife. God showed me. I'm innocent, she's innocent. That's important, isn't it? Because she's going to have Abraham's child pretty soon. Is it going to be a, a year later? It's, it's pretty important that that was, uh, that was known to everyone that was there. He pays the price of 20 brides to try to help clear her name in all of this incredible charity. And then the cure. Well, we don't really know what was going on until we get to, ch to verse 17 and 18. So Abraham prayed to God. And God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants. Then they bore children. For the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, uh, Abraham's wife. So uh, that's, that was the curse. That was the judgment of God. Abraham prays, uh, and they are cured. Does that indicate to us that Abraham's right with the Lord again? I think it does. I think it does. I think by the time he gets rebuked by the pagan king, uh, he's probably feeling that. You ever have an unbeliever rebuke you? I have. I mean, you guys are like me, like, oh, no, I would never happen to me. Uh, just because you haven't done something the way you were supposed to do. For me, it was usually umpires. Let me like, just clarify that. <laughs> but uh, uh, probably other people as well. But, uh, <clears throat> and you're the pastor? You know, I... I, I I hate that. You know, it's nothing worse than a, you're playing softball or I'm coaching and the umpire says to me, hey, aren't you Pastor Tim? Yeah, that was a good call. And I just have to go back to the dugout, you know. I hated that always. But, uh, but, here, that, but I tell you, it causes you to examine your life. Uh, apparently, Abraham does. Uh, that's my take on this. He's praying. He's acting as a prophet of God. God's answering his prayer. I think it's an indication that he's right with the Lord uh, again. But God, again, has to heal the wombs of the gals so that they can uh, have children. There's a, there's a little line in the Jewish Talmud that says that um, because of the curse on Abimelech, even the birds in his home could not lay eggs. In other words, big deal. But uh, uh, I don't know whether that's true or not, but... Uh, 
uh, here's, here's the curse removed. God, did God close their wombs? Did God prevent some women from being able to have children? Yes. And did God then, through prayer, open those wombs so those same, same women could have children? Yes. Does God still do that today? Yes. We need to call upon the name of the Lord. I, remember was, uh, I was really a young, a young believer, but I would, um, in, in, in my eyes anyway, I was a couple of years old in the Lord, and I would uh, be at Calvary Hunalu, pray for people. <clears throat> I didn't think I should be up right there, but the Pastor Bill said, stand up here and pray for people when they come up. And I told you, I didn't know what to do, so I'd just stand by Danny Lehman and just do whatever he did. And then uh, on one of those occasions, uh, a young couple uh, came forward, and, um, and I think there was nobody left, so they came to me. Everybody else was probably busy praying for people, so they just came to me. Because usually if we pray for people, we kind of do it in a group, two, three people. So when God does something, it's not like he did it or she did it or it was his words or his, you know, it was just God did it. You know, and that's a good way to, to do things. That's why we try to pray, you know, with a, a couple of people. But it just happened to be one of those occasions, uh, and I prayed for them because they were, had been trying for several years, unable to conceive. And, uh, and I prayed for them. I can't tell you, it was like great faith or whatever. Although, it was just, you know, we, we were seeing God answer our prayers, you know, as a young couple and different things. And uh, we were convinced God could do whatever God wanted to do. Uh, and uh, prayed for her. They, uh, they came to me uh, a couple of months later. Uh, two or three months later to tell me that she was pregnant. Uh, and then nine months later, she delivered and had a son, and they named him Timothy. I just saw him again at the uh, prophecy conference. We used to see each other, you know, and the church was small and growing, and later we came over and planted the church, and they went out to the west side with uh, Charles, and well, that kid's a grown young man now. He's probably 25 years old or something, but... Uh, <clears throat> I still get kind of real humbled and real choked up every, every time I, uh, if I see him sitting as a family and, you know, because he's so much older, I would never recognize him when I see him with his mom and dad. I just think, wow, God, you're awesome. God still does that, you know. Seek people out. Get prayer when things are going on in your life. Nothing too small, nothing too big. God still does the same things that he did here with Abimelech. Abraham's a guy that's committing the same old sin the guy with character is Abimelech. There's a confrontation, incredible charity. There's a cure for the household. And then we have a covenant that's entered into. Now, here's where we want to jump in the story to chapter 21 uh, over to verse 22, 34. We'll come back to 2021 20, next week and cover the birth of Isaac. But just to conclude the story of Abimelech and, uh, and Abraham. Verse 22, and it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phil call. The commander of the army, his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, with my offspring, or with my posterity. That's bad when the you know, pagan guy says, you're not stealing that lying thing. Or, and I'm just kind of double-checking here. Uh, but that according to the kindness that I have done to you, you will do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. And Abraham said, I will swear. Taking the opportunity, doesn't say that, but uh, verse 25. Then Abraham rebuked Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I did not know uh, who has done this thing. Uh, you did not tell me, nor had I heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves then Abimelech asked Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set by themselves? And he said, You will take these seven ewe lambs from my hand, that they may be my witness that I have dug this well. Therefore he called that place Beersheba, because of the two of them swore an oath there. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech rose with Philcal, the commander of his army, and they returned to the land of the Philistines, then Abraham planted a Tazmarek tree in Beersheba, and there called in the name of the Lord, the everlasting God, and Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines many days. The point of all this, we see in verse 27, is that uh, Abimelech shows up at some time later, 
and uh, says that, uh, you know, I've dealt generously with you, and, uh, and we're on a good relationship now, and I recognize that you're a man of God, and God's hand is upon you, and so forth, and, and uh, we don't really know what tangible, other than the, the initial prayer was answered, but uh, we can certainly uh, assume there were some other things about the life of Abraham that indicated that to, uh, to this Philistine king. And he says, I just want to make sure that you're going to deal with my son uh, in the same way, and his son, and however long you're here and in my land, you'll continue to deal fairly, so forth. And Abraham says, I'll swear to that. And so then they take the animals, as they did in Genesis 15, and they cut covenant with each other. They took those animals, and they would have, remember, cut them in two. They both would have walked in between, saying that, if I break my word on this promise, may what happened to these animals happen to me. Pretty, pretty serious deal. So they cut covenant. And then the question is, but why the seven female lambs? Why the gift on top of that? Uh, didn't have to do it. Abraham picks seven you female lambs, worth more value, and he wants to just give them uh, as, as a gift to him uh, to kind of like say, I want to just make sure this is really settled between us. I realize that you know, we didn't really get off to the best start here in our relationship. And uh, I want to make sure you know, you know that, uh, that we've dealt with this situation because he brings up the issue of the wealth. Uh, because the, uh, apparently he's dug a well, Abraham dug a well. He's using it, very valuable water in that part of the world. And of course it says, <clears throat> verse 27, that, um, or excuse me, a little later, that the, the well was seized. It means it was taken by force. Of course, uh, Bimelech says, I didn't even know anything about it. No one ever told me. I didn't know about it to this day. We know that that's true because God said he's a man of integrity. Uh, and Abraham, and basically they, they kind of take care of the problem that they had with each other. They didn't just sweep it under the rug. They actually said, that's great that you want to have this relationship. You want it to continue. Uh, I appreciate that. But you know, there's another situation we need to talk about. Because you or somebody or those that are under your command have done something to me and my men that they should not have done. Well, I didn't know about it. Well, let's work it out. Okay, great. No, it's your well, no problem. Abraham then says, well, then I'm going to give you these seven ewe lambs. It would be like you went to someone and said, you know, I heard that you said this about me, and I was really offended by that. No, no, I, I didn't really say that. I don't know how that, you didn't say that? Oh, no, that's, man, that's a relief, you know, because I appreciate our, our relationship. And hey, praise the Lord. Hey, here's $1,000. I mean, this, these sheep are worth a lot of money. That's not, any, that's not a stretch. Here's a thousand bucks. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, I've actually done this on occasion. I really didn't know this story. I, I just had somebody that was kind of rubbing me the wrong way, but they were somebody that I looked up to spiritually. Uh, I was anticipating them having a, a role in, in my life and my development as a, as a young believer. I didn't really know, you know, how to, I didn't really know how to deal with it. And I, uh, but I was just praying, and you know, you get an impression. Impressions are just impressions. It could be from the chili the night before, you know. But I had an impression that I should give him a gift. Uh, it turned out the impression was from the Lord because I went ahead and gave him something I had that was of value to me, and I, I gave it to them. <laughs> they, they're like oblivious. Oh, that's nice. Hey, great. I don't know, you know, it really didn't do much for them, but it brought a lot of healing in my own heart. And uh, it really solidified that relationship. Uh, and that person did go on in time and have a tremendous influence over my life. But I, bitterness could have gotten in very early on. Uh, and there's something about this. And this is, this is so Middle Eastern Asian, what, uh, what he's doing. Come on, come on, local people. What's he doing? When you, there you go, omiyaki. Omiyagi. He's giving him a gift. It's like when you, I'll, I'll pick on Tia because she's not, not, not here this morning. Tia's from Japan and she's been fellowshipping. She is. <laughs> Konnichiwa. Uh, hey, how did you sneak in? Tia will come to our house about once a week to see Kathy so they can uh, talk. And the girls have been doing some uh, sewing lessons and stuff. But uh, 
Tea is very Japanese, like local Japanese. She always bring, brings good pastries. <laughs> so Gabby has to say, please, please don't, don't bring any more gifts. But th that's how it is here, right? I mean, I, uh, the whole time Kathy had her, her dress business, we kind of uh, had a flow of, uh, <coughs> of local gals that would come over and buy their mumus and stuff for uh, a long time out of, the, out of the house and everything. They would always bring you know, something with them because you just don't show up empty-handed. Even, hey, I'm Holly, but I've already bought my, uh, uh, my gifts for going to Japan you know, because I'm not going to go over there and not give them gifts because it says something about my relationship with them. It's a cultural thing. And I have to tell you if you're, sorry, but if you're from the US mainly, you don't really quite get that. You know, how these from the mainland show up your house, they ain't got nothing. You know, you're just trying to get them to get their shoes off before they get in the door because they don't even know they're disrespecting and dishonoring you by doing that. So that, that's a big enough issue right there. You're not really expecting much. But this is, but you can kind of relate to this. You understand where Abraham's coming from? I want our relationship to be right. Hey, let me bless you. Let me give you something. Because this, your relationship with me is a value. And I want you to know that. It's pretty interesting that, uh, that, that this is here. Well, let's finish this. Abraham calls on the name of the Lord. And it's a new name. El Olam, the everlasting God. Back in chapter 14, it's El Oyon, the God most high Chapter 17, El Shaddai, God Almighty, the All-Sufficient One, and now a brand new name. Again, one writer said, I think it was Ken Hughes, that said, what an encouragement to know the everlasting God. Wells would disappear. Trees would be cut down. You lambs would grow up and die. Altars would crumble. Treaties would perish. But the everlasting God would remain. He doesn't change. Everlasting means everlasting the way he deals with Abraham is everlasting. It's the way he deals with us so often. We're messing up, and he's just saying, hey, just, will you just kind of look my way a little here so I can bless you? And, we're, and it just catches us off guard because we're not really looking for it, and we're not really expecting it. Came across the, the Sunday school song, you know, Jesus Loves Me. There's a, a little verse <clears throat> at the end I wasn't familiar with that says, Jesus loves me when I'm good, when I do the things I should. Jesus loves me when I'm bad, though it makes him very sad. But he still loves us. Now, I'm thinking that we probably should just kind of give this message like once a month, just kind of just hammer it home for about a, about a year, you know, because I know that a week from now, I'm going to need to hear it again. I'm not going to do that, by the way, but... What a, what, a great, what a great word for us. It's not performance-based. We're saved by grace through faith. This is not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works, so no one could boast. It's a, it's a simple message, <clears throat> but we just think God thinks the way we think, and he doesn't, and he doesn't, and we're so thankful. Well, let's pray. Lord, we do just uh, come to you and we pray that this concept of grace and your love for us, and it's not because of anything that we do that you love us, you just do. Lord, and yet uh, we do want to have a, a witness. We want to be men and women of character and integrity. We don't want to be beset by the same sins over and over again. So, Lord, help us deal with those issues and, and those they things and get a proper perspective so that we don't revisit and don't continue to, to go back. Lord, but uh, we do have a sin nature, but we have a new nature as well. Lord, help us feed the new nature that it grows strong and is victorious over our own selfish desires. Lord, we know you'll love us when we're bad, but uh, we don't want to make you sad. So, Lord, we just pray for that, uh, that work of your spirit and that great understanding of your grace that you might uh, really change our relationship this morning, change how we, we think about you, and that it would uh, be evident in our lives and how we deal with others around us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.